Hello, everyone. Um, so, a turtle was walking down the street, and it was accosted by a group of snails. And uh, they beat him up, left him for dead in a, in a ditch. And finally, he rolled himself over, and he was able to get to a police station. And he was talking with the cops. The cops said, what happened? Uh, what the guys looked like? You know, tell us a little bit about the situation. He says, honestly, I, I just don't know. Everything happened so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I was encouraged to start with the jokes. So. I didn't really get it. I was slow with jokes, but you know. So I'm I'm John Mashey. Um, I run an organization called the Veterans Healing Farm, and uh, we're located in Hendersonville, North Carolina. It's right outside of Asheville. If you guys are familiar with Asheville, uh, they call it the land of the waterfalls, and I refer to it as the land of milk and honey. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it was Privileged to grow up there and um, move back after I, I got out of the military. Uh, the Veterans Healing Farm is an organization my wife and I started. Um, our mission is to serve our, our nation's veterans by growing and donating nutrients against food, uh, or vegetables, produce. I need to read. I don't know what's going on right now. I'm sorry. Uh, donating nutriently dense fruits, vegetables, and flower bouquets to veterans and their caregivers free of charge. Additionally, we foster a thriving community of veterans and civilians who build uh, deep friendships and cultivate emotional, physical, and spiritual health. So I just, I figure, you know, before we jump into the tools, which is obviously what you guys are here for, I want to tell you a little bit about our operation, kind of what we do. Um, this is kind of my heart. This is the thing that drives me. And in order for me to be able to do this, I've essentially been working on uh, tools and techniques that um, make it possible for us to grow a lot of food. And um, our person of the week, Cousin Fellow Veterans, tap into a fertile ground for him. Four years ago, John Moshi started a project that can eventually be a model across the country. As News 13's John Lee reports, the food they grow is the result of an uplifting process. I just had this vision of creating a space. When you think of farming, it's natural to focus on the food. The better feeling for feeds a need for something more. When you feel the love today, it will be forever. Whether or not you serve our country, pineapple or habanero is the same thing. Founder John Nash says there's a seat at the table for you. What this represents for me is, is more the community component of our farm. This is, this is a tool that brings people together. We can all talk about it, John. Come build a support system from the ground up. Once you get around and you hear his conviction, his passion, uh, his authenticity for what, what this is all about. John, we just talking about you. I think it tells a lot about the people that I've been surrounded by, honestly. There's no way this would have happened. What's happened? All right. Now, ready? Cultivates peace far removed from a battle. So if you guys want to help, we're going to just prep these three rows real quick. The Air Force vet and an army of volunteers grow a bounty of fresh produce that's given away at the VA hospital. This is purely the fact that they serve our country and we want to demonstrate to them love and respect. With the help of veterans like Dwayne Davis, the group donated some 87,000 pounds of fruits and veggies last year. John, you want to smooth over the top of these and fill it in? And the therapeutic value is a revelation for those with post-traumatic stress. To give back to veterans that suffer with PTSD is very healing. It's healing for me and it's healing for other veterans. Farming is the framework that helps overcome painful memories, and not all of them are tied to the military. It's a very sensitive subject. In 2001, John Fed Tony died in a motorcycle accident just weeks after 9 11. This brings me an opportunity to honor my father's legacy. John never expected to earn stripes as a farmer. In the process, he helps fellow vets embrace a meaningful mission. There's no question, this is, this is saving people's lives. You know, I, I would go as far as to say this has saved my life. In Henderson County, being in an environment where people actually care is so important. John Lee, who was 13. Wonderful thing to do. <laughs> so.
uh, it's just a little idea. And by the way, it was 8,700. There's a difference between uh, one zero would make. I think if it was potatoes, it probably would have been uh, 87,000, but kale doesn't weigh a lot. Um, so <laughs> we gave away uh, 8,500 pounds of produce this year. Uh, in addition to that, we have 50 families that have helped grow the food. So basically, there's no fees associated with it. They show up, they help work. We have a bunch of different squads. We have a beef squad, sheep squad, hop squad, and squad. Um, and they show up, do whatever's assigned to their squad, and then they get to take the produce home. They took home 6,000. And then this year, we added the cut flowers, and we gave away uh, 650 bouquets. And um, yeah, so it's, it's right in the main entrance of the hospital. Between 8 and 10 on Tuesday mornings at the Asheville VA Hospital. And, you know, there's no strings attached. We don't care what people's income are. When people walk by and say, oh, say that for the guy that can't afford it, we emphasize that that's not what we're here for. We're not a, a food pantry. Uh, we're here showing them love, honor, and respect. So um, here's just to give you guys uh, um, another couple pictures. Um, so some of the methods we utilize uh, there. This, this garden here hasn't been tilled. Um, or we did in about four years. Um, we didn't uh, turn the irrigation on in, in two, two years. Um, and then that's that garden right there. So that's actually our smaller garden. This is a flower garden primarily this year. We have a bunch of other stuff going on in it. And then this is a medicinal herb garden. Uh, these are uh, different raspberries. Uh, these are hops. Uh, this is an orchard. Uh, this was for watermelons. And there's a, this is a meditation garden in here. This is our bigger garden right here. And uh, we had the plastic on, made the American flag. This is the sheep, and we have chickens here, and bees, and this is a big um, compass rose garden. And so there's all sorts of these things I could keep going. Uh, this facility right here is what we're in the process of, um, been working on it for a little bit, but we're almost done with it. And it's, uh, it's a 40-foot chipping container that's got eight bunk beds in it, a bathroom facility. Um, it's a 20-footer. They're connected with a big deck. It's 75 foot long, 35 foot wide. Got a bunch of panels getting ready to get uh, put it up, so it's all completely off grid. Big monitor screen here, so folks will come out from around the country. We'll um, host these events where we're basically going to be doing training to uh, empower other veterans throughout the country with the techniques and methods that have worked for us uh, in order to spread this program. Um, so that that will be the classroom. We'll have a, a VR or a 360 camera mounted right in the front, so any veteran throughout the country can put on a um, VR headset, look left, look right. They're essentially be, be able to attend in real time. We'll stream it and have somebody monitoring the feed so the speaker can be addressing the kids' question in Arkansas. Um, eventually, we'll create a program um, that will allow them to, you know, every conference we host, we'll, we'll record and create an online training program that we're going to be inspiring other veterans. And so the key is like, is the community component. I, I look at it as like, I'm first and foremost, I'm, I'm really not a farmer. Um, I consider myself more of an artist, but in terms of the produce or the sheep or the medicinal, all these different components, those are all tools to bring people together. And you know, it's this idea that the, the, the growing up produce is really important. Having access to nutriently dense food, very important, but if you're not connected in community, uh, it's kind of a holistic mindset from my perspective. You need access to good food. You need physical exercise. You benefit from the personal empowerment that comes from growing your own medicine, doing these activities. But to have that um, opportunity to be in relationship to where if somebody says, how are you doing, they actually want to know the answer to the question. And I think in our society, it's uh, increasingly more difficult to find places uh, that provide that. On to... Um, the, the reason why you guys came here. Uh, so we're going to go through some of these innovations. Uh, if you haven't gotten a handout already, is there anyone? Before I start, I want to make something clear. Um, I don't claim to be a know-it-all. Like this, these techniques or these tools that I've been working on, like most of them have happened in the last six months. 
I don't know how to describe it. I'm in this space in which things are just coming to me. It's exhausting. Um, I'm an executive director of a nonprofit. I'm the manic maniac that stays up till four in the morning, talking to myself, sweating, and having these crazy ideas. But then I wake up in the morning, and, and you have to be able to trust me with your money. And I'm stable. Yes, sir. Where is this located? We're in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So it's right outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And um, and my wife and I, we have two kids. She's actually pregnant with our third right now. And so there's a lot going on. There's possibly, you know, I'm not even say possibly. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to apologize. I, I told myself I'm not going to apologize if I started. Now I'll just keep going. Um, if you guys have questions or comments, just know like these are this is the best I could do, and so I don't claim to have it all figured out. But uh, that said, we're going to begin to go into it. So, you know, low low tech uh, farm hacks. What's the why in terms of what I'm trying to do? What, what's the purpose for it? And you know, there's a UN report that. If you're not familiar with it, um, it says that small-scale farming is the only way to feed the world. And this is not debatable. This is absolutely, without question, the future. And we know that, right? Everybody, I mean, the scientists know that. The agriculturalists know it. It's very easy to, to acknowledge the problem. You know, this tomato and that tomato, the coolest thing about the technology that, that they've come up with here, the gizmo, is there is a difference between the two tomatoes, right? They may look the same, but the nutrient content is tremendously different. It's a world of difference. Uh, the two carrots are not created equal. And having the ability to zap a carrot and it tell you if it's decent or excellent or, or poor in terms of the nutrition is fantastic, but it's very disruptive. It's a very disruptive technology, which I love disruption. I think it's fantastic, but I think we have to acknowledge the fact that with every pro comes a con. We have this kind of survey and almost predict things ahead of time. Um, and so what are some of the problems? I think the problems are fairly simple. Um, when you go to Bray or Elaine, or it's so crazy to be at this conference right now. Like These are all the people. I, I was sitting at lunch with um, Elliot Coleman came up to our table. It's, like, it's crazy. But um, you listen to these folks speak, and what do you find out? Like It's, it's, it's almost simple. And I just wrote this literally five minutes ago, so I don't know if it's going to read per perfectly, but tillage kills biology. When you till, you kill biology, you destroy the structural integrity of the soil, you release carbon, you burn off the organic matter, and you basically let the topsoil um, you know, wash away. Fertilizers and pesticides, it's, it's a secular cycle. You use this stuff, and what happens now, the plants no longer communicate to the with their fungal hyphae network, they're not communicating with microbes, they don't need the microbes, the microbes aren't working, it's the difference between us going on the IV drip line and not using our gut. And so as a result, you've got plants that no longer are in relationship with that. Then what happens with diseases and pests are more prevalent. And so you use, you know, when you use the bag of 10, 10, 10, then eventually it leads to you using, um, you know, some, uh, some, some pesticide, and then that leads to using a fungicide, and then that leads to using, and it just keeps going. Um, the microaggregates, when you till, you, you break up your soil, that becomes bacterial dominated. Uh, the bacterial dominated soil is where your weeds are found. So it's a cycle, it's a secular cycle. And it doesn't take very many of these conferences to, to learn this stuff. It's, it's pretty evident, right? It's almost simple, very simple. And I always want it to be simple. I'm like, just give me the, the heart of it. Give me the essence. That's what I'm trying to give you guys today. I stole this from David's talk earlier. Uh, the solution is simple. All the experts will tell you exactly what the solution is. Maintain permanent ground cover. Don't distill the, uh, disturb the soil. And use diverse crop rotations. Like That's the answer. And the question is, what are the tools required for small-scale farmers to implement these solutions? Like, what do we use? Um, here are some of the, the um, tools we're going to go over today. You guys have the uh, flyer or handout in front of you, and we'll just launch into it. Here you are. Yeah. Um, so the first one's up. Let's get on it. Cover crop roller crimper. All right. So here's the deal. Um, right now. For cover crop, which cover crop is like the answer. I think that's like the most important topic, in my opinion. I mean, 
if I had to rank them, I would put cover crop at the very top. Cover crop is so vital. It's so important. What's the problem with no-till? What's the problem with cover crop right now? There's no tools for it. There really aren't. This tool right here is not going to be on a small-scale farm. A market gardener that's using raised beds cannot break out a giant roller crimper on a tractor. Uh, these BCS tools are decent. The problem with these is when you have to have BCS. Two, it doesn't work on uh, raised gardens. There, there, there are limitations with this. Third, this isn't even really an option. That's like a nice gimmick, but if you're actually out there on a field and you've got a decent sized piece of property that you're farming, you're not going to walk around with a little stick stepping on it. Um, if you know that person, I just grabbed these random photos, so I apologize <laughs> if... Uh, <laughs> what is that nice photo? Uh, this is like a piece of um, angle iron that's screwed onto a board that you basically walk on it and step on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. Um, so, uh, this is our farm as of this morning. Um, this is the back field. There's a bunch of road behind us. So, you know, we use a um, technique in which we use uh, discarded wood chips. We have loads of them get dropped off for us for a charge to waste byproduct. Um, this, you know, within short periods of time, when you put your hand and flip it up, the whole thing is just my ceiling, one big giant um, mat that keeps the weeds from penetrating. The cover crop that we're growing on the top is what we're going to be terminating in the spring. And the roller crimper, um, if you think of a roller crimper, back to this picture here, um, you know, this is a chevron pattern. This helps with big fields, but if you're just doing the raised bed, you know, that row, you can go up, up and down a couple times if you need to. Um, but the idea is you're crimping. You're putting lots of weight on a small piece of metal that's crimping it. If you cut it, if you flail it, or if you go through, which again, when you're dealing with these raised mounds, which is really important in our area because we have heavy clay soil, um, permanent beds, in my opinion, are, are very helpful. Uh, also, we have a bunch of kids running around, so by having kind of clear where the garden garden is, um, and for rotation, all these various things, I'm not going to go into all that, but the idea is that, um, you know, when I thought about it, what is that? This is essentially, if you think of a snow chain, that you wrap around your tire. Um, using the angle iron with slots cut into it, um, this is essentially you can use strapping, ratchet strapping, when you ratchet it in, or you can, um, if you want to use metal, the, the good thing about using the, the cloth, although it's, you know, the quality of it, and again, some of these are still, I'm still testing them. I, I purposefully want to be rough on them because I want to see if they can actually, you know, hold up to, to real farm work. Uh, but but by having it not a solid metal band, which would work fine, um, this actually collapses. So these units can be purchased for uh, approximately 100 bucks. Uh, oftentimes people have them, they use them for uh, good soil to seed contact and other, um, other different things. So here's some list of benefits, is that it's designed to be used on a raised bed. Um, this unit here is the one I actually have, and if you can imagine having a long stick to where two guys or two folks on one, one side and the other. And I say guys, I do not, okay. I have to get out of that habit. I should just say folks, because I'm from the South, so I can get away with it, or y'all. Um, but the idea is that if you're walking on each side, you know, this can be on the, on the bed itself. Um, when you fill it with water, they come in different sizes, there's different versions of them. The metal actually adds weight to it, but approximately 300 to 500 pounds, which is, Based on everything I have to work with, I wouldn't be presenting things to you if it was just a gimmick. Based on everything I have to work with is sufficient. This, this, this tool looks like everything's good to go in terms of it actually doing what I'm kind of suggesting it is capable of doing. The beauty is once you're done with it, you can dump out the water, put it in the back of your Honda Civic and drive off. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the biggest thing is, you know, I went through a metal company that actually cut it to size for me. You can buy it at Lowe's. It's a little bit more expensive when you buy it as individual uh, pieces from a box store, but that, that is an option. Um, and then it can be switched back to the original tool, and it's essentially human powered. So I'm going to, like, try to crush these. There's 12 of them to get through. If we go through too many questions, if you have something that's really pertinent and you feel like it's relevant, then ask it. But if if you have just a general question, we can wait until the end. That way I can, yes, sir. How do you attach the cord to the roller? So this right here, have you ever used a ratchet strap? Okay. Yeah, so you ratchet it on. 
It's a two-person tool? It's one-person tool, but I mean, you're working with a lot of water. But, you know, if you have two people, it makes it easier. I'll put it that so way. So you pull it? Um, you know, these are actually designed to be pushed, but I, I've experienced pulling it is a better option. Yeah, if, you, if you've ever seen people use the garden rollers, um, they are designed to be pushed, but they, they work in both. It's one of the same. One's not assembled. Correct. Well, these are just different options. You know, there, there are some that have the wider handles, other ones. You use something like this. This middle bar needs to be cut and bolted onto the sides in order for the clearance of the, um, of, of the angle iron. Because this is a three inch crimp that it's providing. All right, so now let's say you are successfully able to terminate the cover crop. What next? How do you plant into it? Um, you need to cut it. You've got to be able to, if you ever see these, in, in, again, I reverse engineer stuff. So I'm looking at conventional ag, big ag, the roller crimper, this monster. What are they doing? What's the essence of they're doing? Oh, they're applying a lot of weight onto a thin piece of metal. Okay, I can do that. What does a seed drill do? A seed drill has a cutting blade on it that slices through the cover crop in order for that seed drill to drill the seam into it, right? Well, you can buy those replacements for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. And um, what I've done is taken a wheel hoe, uh, which is fairly regular, a lot of people have them, and I've converted it by adding a piece of PVC. And so the PVC attaches to the wheel hoe um, it actually turns out to be awesome. It's like a Tron. It just like folds up like this. It goes in the back of the Honda Civic. When you get to where you're going, when you open it, once it gets to this point, it locks. No matter how much pressure you put down on it, it won't collapse it. It just kinks it, basically. And you can add additional weight plates so that, and, and what I've experienced is a couple things. Originally, I started off with the uh, more inexpensive metal version of the Earthway. Um, right here is a weak point on it, depending on how much pressure you put on it, that, that can be compromised. Going with a, a wooden handle version is a better option. Pretty much use any um, wheel cultivator. You probably have to, each one will have to be, you know, the angle is going to be changed in terms of how you're going to attach it. Uh, the PVC isn't something I can get into too much right now. Um, if you notice, or you haven't noticed it yet, you haven't gotten to it yet, but in the next one I'm going to show you uh, also has PVC. PVC is very awesome. I love PVC. It's, it's one of those things to where um, with a heat gun and a little bit of pressure, and you should do it outside and um, you know, don't raise in the fumes, but if you don't get it too hot, you can bend it and it won't lose its structural stability. And you can drill it and you can make all sorts of tools. You can get it spare, the scrap stuff laying around from uh, plumbers all the time have it available um, or just purchase it. It's not expensive. So, Basically, um, you bent it, you put a bolt in here, a bolt in there, and if you, again, want to add extra weight to it, um, also these blades can be sharpened to help cut the um, cover crop more efficiently. And so you can then um, go through with your earthway seeder and seed into that, or we're going to go on to the next, um, next tool, which is the paper pot transplanter. Show of hands is how many people are familiar with this device? I figure most people would be, well, not this device, but the, the paper pot transplanting. Okay, so cool. I'll, I'll get into it and explain for folks that aren't. Um, so, the easiest way to describe a paper pot transplanter, and I wish I would have had a video of it, or actually I do have a video of it, so you'll see in a second. But if you can imagine the inside of corrugated cardboard, it looks almost like a honeycomb grid, the inside of corrugated cardboard. If you took that and opened it up, you'd have a, a bunch of little uh, honeycomb grids, right? Imagine putting uh, media on that and sowing seeds into it, and when those seeds were ready to be transplanted, it can hold on to it and it just unraveled. That's how this works. So this machine basically, instead of transplanting plants, this allows you to pull a piece of cardboard, it unravels, and it, and it transplants at the rate of uh, 246 plants. And, 10 minutes or something like that. It's insanity. It's like the first time you ever see it, you're like, this is amazing. Oh my goodness. Um, there's a couple of things to it that, oh wait, there's a catch. So, you know, uh, it's easy, it's quick to find out. Actually, there's more to the story. It's, it's not all funny games. Um, this tool right here comes from a traditional earthway cedar. So I'm going to go ahead and say something real quick. Like, my philosophy is that. Again, I'm, I'm an artist, and as an artist, there's a term in the art community called appropriation. 
It's different than what horticulturalists or farmers use the word appropriate. When you say appropriate technology, you're talking about small sustainable technologies. Um, when artist says he appropriated <coughs> an idea, this is uh, Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. All right, to appropriate an idea is to take this idea and that idea, put them together and make something new. And the idea is that if you use a pre-existing technology, instead of having to have kind of a tinkering degree, uh, engineer slash uh, fabricator slash welder slash carpenter, um, this tool here is, is made, been made for a very long time, and it's relatively inexpensive. You know, these things are made of high quality aluminum. They are uh, mass produced so the company can buy them at bulk, which makes them be able to sell it way cheaper than what you would ever be able to buy it for. And, you know, to use it as essentially a template, you know, a frame, um, what I've done is I've, I've used PVC again and I've bent it, you know, and I'll show you a little bit more, but let me show you a video just so you can get an idea of what it does. Plug tree, these plants would have to stay in the greenhouse for at least two more weeks to allow the root system to develop properly. However, this paper pot technology allows the plant to transition you can see the root system that's coming right out. So this plant is actually ready to be transplanted right now. The paper is the magical part about it. This is the stuff that makes it so innovative. And so what we've done is we've essentially taken a earthquake cedar, and this device I've modified. And so I've been able to take a cutting disc from a no-till planter and put it on the front of the earthquake cedar and I've made it to where this tray allows the paper pot to be put right inside of it. Now, one of the coolest things is when you sow this, you can actually do a variety of different crops and also different cultivars. And so you can have lettuce that's red, green, red, green. And that pattern, when this pulls out, will actually follow the pattern of the different crops that you're putting in. So what we're going to do right now is demonstrate what that looks like using lettuce that would not be transplanted. Actually, a standard plug tray is about 128 plants, and it usually takes about 45 minutes to an hour. You can get quicker than that, but typically in the sun, that's what you're working with. This is substantially faster than that, and it makes it to where you can essentially have perfect spacing guaranteed. All right, so I'm going to do a demonstration. This is 246 plants. Uh, these are 55 foot rows. We're going to go up and come back down, and um, here we go. So this machine, again, this is a technology that's available. It's been available for quite a while. And um, there was actually SEER sponsored a, a, a report on it. And I think that was back in 20, when was that? I want to say 2014, 2013 or 2014. And it basically concluded that for the price of it, so this unit right here, um, you know, again, it's been around for a while. It, it hasn't been until this year. Johnny's picked it up. Uh, Curtis Stone did a video on it. Some of these other folks have been pushing it. Um, the reason why it was originally, it didn't really get too much traction when it first came out, because this, this was originally developed in Japan. I think they used it for beat production. And the idea is that 
the soil for this machine, if you ever watch a video of them using this big orange machine, that's pulverized. You have to have pulverized soil. If you have any kind of plant material, rock debris, heavy clay, it's going to mess up. It just doesn't work. Um, in addition to that, it's $1,000 just for the unit. Um, there are other costs associated with it that I'll get into in a second. It's, the package sells for about $3,000, $2,500 to $3,000. And so the, the, the question of like, well, is it worth the money? Um, and for me, I'm always thinking, what about the people that don't have this money? You know, that's a big question for me. And then also, how do we use it? I mean, again, if the answer is no-till, how, you know, how do you pulverize your soil? You can't have the best of both worlds. And you save time on the upfront of planting, but when you till your soil and you bring up all your wheat seeds, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to pay for it down the road. Um, so some of the lists, you get to plant the starts earlier. When I was saying you can't put this plant out, if you guys are familiar with uh, plug tray 128 plants, um, to get that thing out, if, if it's teeny tiny like that, the roots aren't going to be developed, you're going to basically um, jeopardize the plant. So you have to wait until it gets proper size. One problem is that window is so small and immediately starts going root bound, which has long-term consequences for the plant. Um, which this, you get it out before it starts to do that, it naturally transitions into the ground and you don't have to keep it in the greenhouse. Um, you can increase the transplanting planting seed uh, speed. You're able to get perfect spacing. Now, right now, it's still limited because you can only get it in those fairly small cell packs, which means you're obviously not using it for tomatoes or peppers or things of that nature. I'm fairly confident that the technology, again, I look at this stuff, this is just an iteration. It's just one, this is like the first, people are just thinking, you have to always think about it. Like, I'm not worried about how it's being used. I want to know how it can be used. I'm going to think about various ideas of how we can take this technology and apply it in other areas. Uh, the idea right now is that it uses acetone. I think most organic certification boards won't certify it. Um, it's very expensive. It's cheap cardboard. It shouldn't be anything but cheap because it's all it's using is, is a very inexpensive product. Um, and so I'm convinced that there's a future opportunity for larger cells and then also um, material that is organically certifiable. Um, so, let's see, um, advantages over the, the big orange machine, um, and I'm not hating, it's not like that, I'm just, you know, trying to keep it real. Um, so it works on soils with heavy uh, clays and, res uh, you know, residual, uh, residue left over. You can, you can use a hundred dollar earth weight, you can usually buy these things on Craigslist for 50 bucks. You can push it forward instead of pulling it back. Um, you can actually space the rows closer because of the wheelbase. It limits how close you can actually get them. And it's very lightweight, very compact. Um, yes, sir. Can I just ask the room if anyone is actually using this tool? Of course. Uh, anyone using it? It's magical. I didn't, I didn't show you. I wish I would have pointed it out in our garden, but it's really beautiful because you can actually almost create, um, again, like for me, equal importance. Equally important to have really high quality food and beauty. Beauty is not an option. Beauty is very, very important. And the idea of making almost tapestries and just these patterns, like, do you imagine? I mean, we have so much emphasis on polyculture and, and um, what is it, bringing in, um, what's the word, um, for beneficial, uh, what am I trying to say? What is it? Com um, no, whatever. What is it? Pollinators. Pollinators, or, you know, you're trying to attract um, beneficial insects. Well, when you're out in the field and to consistently be trading, um, you know, remembering to put it in, or this just makes it easy. It's done in the process of actually planting. You're basically designing the pattern. Yes, ma'am? How do you, um, how do you get the plants into that paper? So we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, actually, it's the next slide. So this is another option, and this is free. Uh, basically, I've used scrap wood. Uh, the tray fits into it. So this tray right here, the, the paper comes in a very small, thin, uh, it looks about this, this big right here. And the idea is that these um, handles slide into each side and it opens it up. And then it slots onto a frame. Well, that, that spreader bar and frame is $69. The five-gallon stir stick you can get for free at Lowe's works fine. 
Um, and then if you build a frame using tobacco sticks, uh, just any scrap wood, with nails that have been cut and sanded, it, it replaces the frame uh, and is completely free of charge. They also sell this unit, which is a drop seeder. So it's $400 plus $90 per plate. Um, basically, all it is is if you take a wooden box and um, you drill the largest seed you'll ever use. That's the hole you want to drill. You want to take take your your actual um, this right here, put it over a piece of wood so you can mark it, and then go through and drill those holes as big as you know the biggest seed you plan on using. Then, and that's going to be on your base. Then on top of that is a, another piece of wood that goes right on top, and that's going to be the exact side of the seed that you desire to use. And when you offset it, when you scatter the seeds on there it falls into that slot. And the rest of the seeds in the corner here, you have a little hole with a cork in it, so then you can pour the seeds out. So you have the perfect size. This right here doesn't actually work very well, especially when it's um, very um, non-humid, what's the opposite of humidity? Dry. <laughs> when it's very dry, it's hydro, uh, the electricity hits, the seed basically gets stuck. Um, and so there's some issues with that. Whereas this right here, again, it's free and it um, allows you to not have that issue. You just, once the seeds are in the spot, you slide it over, they fall into the hole, and you can see, you know, no time flat. And then if you want to do the pattern, you just run a piece of tape every other. So you do uh, the one seed and then move it over to the other seed. Am I making sense or are you guys tracking? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I sometimes move too quick. Um, so then this right here is basically pulled, it's staked in the ground, and then um, you can use the, um, have I gotten to it? Yeah, the, the cutter that I developed, when you, if you want to use this one, you just cut it. Or you just take a, 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 you know, a spade and just make a little uh, furrow, and then that just unravels into it and then just folds right up. Yes, sir? Do you know the dimensions offhand of the base? Uh, so this right here is actually bigger than standard uh, trays. I'm glad you said that, because this is very expensive. If you price these, are very expensive, and the reason why is because they're not standard. Um, they're true. I forget what the, this is the part that I'm not good at, but when you look into it, you'll figure it out. What I'm good at is figuring out, well, what is it used for? And it's used in rice production. So the people that plant rice, they use these trays. These trays are standard to them. So instead of spending $10 a tray, which is a big what? Well, I'm not gonna, Johnny's is wonderful. They sponsor us, so I don't wanna ever say anything. <laughs> Not like that, but the idea is like there are companies that are selling these devices that are, it, it's just expensive stuff because it's new technology. And again, my objective is always to try to find, um, you know, replacements or, or alternatives. And so um, that leads us on to our next device. So your plants, again, the beauty of this is you can transplant when your plant is very small, right? And obviously, it's important to have good germination because that's the bad side of these things. If you have bad germination of plug tray, you just pick the one with this. When you're pulling it out, it messes everything up. You need to have good germination, right? What do most plants need to germinate properly? <coughs> most plants need darkness. They need 100% humidity, and on average, they need 72 degrees, right? How do you create an environment that provides the perfect scenario for, for plants to germinate? And the way you do that is with the refrigerator. Um, your refrigerators are free of charge at every landfill that you go to. Um, the crock pots are at every thrift store you go to for a couple bucks. And this is a thermostat controller. And the way it works is you set the thermostat controller. This can be found on Amazon for 15 bucks, uh, 20 bucks. Set it to 72 degrees. There's a pro. pro goes up here, uh, somewhere he rises, right? Um, whatever's plugged into it, when the probe is below that temperature, it kicks on whatever's plugged into it. Crop pot's filled with water, plugged in. As soon as it gets below 72 degrees, this is set to high, the water boils, the steam rises. As soon as it hits 72, turns it off, 100% humidity, it's good to go. Um, in the summertime, when the ambient temperature is above that, you can use the uh, humidifier. And um, what I have figured out, a couple important things learned from my mistake, the bottom row here, you need to have a piece of wood or metal or something that, that keeps it from getting direct contact because it's too hot. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. 
And then also, back in the day, there were like a serious issue with people, kids that would get locked up in these refrigerators. So that's something to keep in mind, they're actually mandatory to make you take the doors off when a refrigerator isn't being used. Um, most of the time back in the day, they had locks on the refrigerator, so that's no longer in existence. Um, when you have your, your trays in here, there's no way a kid's going to get in there. Um, but it is something that you do need to be mindful of if, if you're experimenting with this um, particular um, piece of technology. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the black shelves that we see in there, are they this? Yes. Are they just like this, there all the time, or those no, that's this, ones that you pull out? That's this right here. Okay. So the idea that's is the you right, take that right. right there and you, you slide it. So I made this using, uh, and I wish I would have, this is actually an illustration of the exact unit. My buddy just traced it. Um, so this is the refrigerator. And the, this right here was just scrap wood. Yeah. And so this, this essentially was free outside of the thermostat. Yeah. Um, I think I paid $4 for the... So you created slots that the tray is going through. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And so the cardboard when you that you fill with right. your compost or whatever. Um, does that, what form does that come in when you get it? Is that like a, already a, a flat block? Um, do you guys want me to pull up a video? I mean, maybe I won't. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll pull up a video. So the idea is that the cardboard opens up. <coughs> Let's see, uh, the cardboard opens up and it's being held. When you first unravel the paper, you clip it to, to two, this is not the frame, but if, if there were metal spikes here, you clip it to two metal spikes. Then you take handfuls of media and you place it on here. Uh, you can use a dipper to compact it, and then you seat it. And, and now when you pull off the frame, the media keeps it open. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Do you sterilize the media or do you buy it? Do you... you buy media. In the media, typically you want something that is um, doesn't have a lot of like big pieces of bark or anything like that because these are fairly small. Is there a few hand seed form and you have a special shaker that no, this drops right here. the seed? Yeah. So mm -hmm. drop it right here. Yes. Yeah, that's a drop seeder. Yeah, you can see that in um, 30 seconds. So yeah. I guess those holes have to be spaced to the size of the cone. So when you take this sizes, and you put it over here, you use it as a template and you draw and then you drill. You drill that's a hole. Right. Correct. But do the, the, does the honeycomb? paper come in different size cells. No, no, two, four, and six inch spacing is all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. Is that really cardboardish material? Yeah. 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 It does not. That was something we talked about uh, a minute ago, and that's something that I do believe in the future there's going to be. Um, well, I, let's let's get back, let's get into a little bit more, because this is an interesting technology. If, I'm hoping we'll have enough time, because I do want to cover this other stuff. We'll, we'll cover that again, and then we'll go into more details. I think people will probably want to do this. Now, the beauty is, again, you can germinate, very high germination rate, pull it out, let it harden off, and get it in the ground. No need for germ for a greenhouse. Like, how much, this is the most expensive real estate on the planet, your greenhouse spaces. Um, and to be able to go for $20 uh, free, I mean, it's, it's uh, disruptive technology, yes, sir. Are you worried about airflow within that like really tight space? No, no, you want it to be humid. Okay. Yeah. Are you seeing any molds form in the um, soil? There were. What's the product I use? Um, hydrogen peroxide is what I used to. Um, what is that? Oxidate? Is that the stuff? That, oxidate. Yeah, oxidate yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so sterilize it is important. Okay. Um, but the mold that did form didn't didn't cause any harm. I, I didn't have any issues after I sterilized it after that point. But when I did experience it, it was. Yeah. Uh, I would also get mold because I built something like that. Yep. My father set up. Okay. Because it would actually like sprout a tail in like 24 hours. But um, I think after a while, it would just it would get moldy. So it was like cool. As soon as like anything. Sprouts in the germination chamber that beats you got it out because I mean, there's, there's no light, so it gets leggy real quick. Uh, when it's not in use, you leave it open and it's supposed to sit. Yeah. The sun's best. Yeah. Uh, how, how long are you spawning it? It's easy to germinate. De depends on the season. Depends on the season. As fast as, um, yeah, it depends. Um, all right, so now I'm going to move on. So we covered cover crop, super important. In terms of what's the next 
you know, top down, what's the next level of importance? You've got um, you've got cover crop, and then if you listen to Gabe Brown or Ray or m most of these guys, you talk about um, grazing, right? Mob stocking, intensive grazing, animals, very very important. Um, problem is with small scale agriculture, the Joel Salatin methods. I mean, chickens are one thing, right? It's easy to have a little chicken uh, tractor, but how in the world are you supposed to deal with? Uh, so here's the thing is this year, the spring of this year, I was like, you guys saw all the things that we have going on right now. I was like, told my wife, I'm like, I'm done. They were not adding anything else. We had four, we had four beehives. We got a rabbit, we got chickens, like we're good. Lady calls me, she says, I got a $10,000 sheep package. Like the Romadale, uh, California variegated mutant. Like, best, most expensive <laughs> sheep you can have. I mean, give it all to you free of charge. You want it? <laughs> Seriously? Now here's the thing about sheep, like animals in general, like if you have too many crops, you let them go. You can't do that with animals. And it's a lot of work. And I've never raised any animal. I didn't, so I met my wife, just give you guys a quick breakdown. 2007, I met my wife, I took her to the property. I shared with her the vision that I had. I'd never grown anything in my entire life. No idea what I was talking about. And so all this stuff is like, I had to figure it out, right? And so here's the thing about, but, but the way my mind works is I don't really want to know like what the recommended solutions are. I want to know, I want to understand the problem because I'm very capable of coming up with a solution. We all are. We understand the problem. We don't focus on what people are using the solution to currently. We want to understand the problem and then we can create a solution. So the thing about intensive grazing is what are some of the challenges with grazing? You have the fact that your animals are out in the field and you have to keep them protected from predators, uh, which is usually electronetting. Uh, in addition to that, they need shade on hot days. They need water. If, if it's freezing, the water needs to be dealt with regularly. You're consistently having to check in on your animals. You need supplement. If it rains, the supplements get wet. You need maintenance boards. You need hook trimmers. The list is so freaking long. <laughs> so, and I didn't know any of this stuff. I mean, I learned it real quick. So I needed to come up with a solution. And this is what I came up with. So this is a mobile sheep barn. Uh, I've used a... Uh, uh, you can get these very inexpensive, especially now because a lot of people are going to aluminum, so the old steel trailers. Uh, this one was you know, cleaned up, put some paint on it, cut the top off, and built a large roof. Uh, the overhang provides shade, and this, the, the pitch allows water to flow to the front. So this is gutted, and we have a, a rain barrel. It's going to be right here. Um, on the top of the uh, roof, we're mounting panels. Uh, those panels will uh, power a battery bank that will have heating elements to keep the water from freezing. You can fill it up at the tap, take it out in the field. Uh, 55 gallons will last for a little while. And then when it rains, it's topping it off. Um, and you can keep the water from freezing. In addition to that, the uh, mineral supplements are in here. Uh, we're building shelves in here, in which are going to have the uh, extra mineral su supplements, um, any sort of like dewormer if we ever need it, the hook trimmers. Um, let me actually get into, so this is the, uh, the hay rack. Um, and so uh, here are some of the different kind of things going on with it, list of benefits. Um, reduces the challenges related to intensive grazing. Again, the re intensive grazing, you know, the idea of being able to move your animals every day is a great idea, but how do you do it practically? Like, I don't have a dog. I let the animals out once. I'll never do that again. It was such a bad idea. Like, it took me forever. And there's a reason why the shepherds have a crook on the thing so they can grab them because you can, I'm fast. And I promise these guys are just, yeah, you know, good luck with that. So, you know, you can set it up right next and let them go in. But the idea is taking them here to all the way to this side of the piece of property. Like, being able to lure them in here with some grain, shut them up, and, um, this, well, let's just keep going. So uh, 55 gallon has a uh, first flush diverter. If I had unlimited money, I would have done metal roof, uh, being that we have a uh, shingled roof, you know, having uh, a filter, a water filter is probably pretty important. Um, the overhang provides the shelter. Uh, the solar system is actually providing the electricity for the electronetting. So instead of having to bring out the electronetting or the battery, keeping it charged, you've got a battery bank that's in the system itself. Um, you can put in a, um, you know, an inverter on it so any kind of motion detector lights can be put on it. Um, hay storage, extra hay storage, 
and then on the side you can do a, a feeding rack. So in the wintertime when you're when your pasture can do it. Again, I don't know any of this stuff, so I'm trying to get our pasture going and all this stuff. But in the meantime, you know, we're supplementing with some hay, and uh, that we can have a, a rack on the side. On the other side will be uh, a milking stanchion that will fold down. Um, so this right here is basically a wheel with a sprocket. This is a winch. Um, these winches are very expensive. Part of them is shown with you press a button and, and it's a remote control. So the idea is that as that winch moves, you have, instead of having a winch that pulls something up, you have it on a belt, or not a belt, but a, um, you guys know what I'm saying? Here. Um, yeah, and so it is, it's running off your 12 volt system. And so basically the idea is that you get them in here, take down the netting, you press the button and it moves itself, kind of steer it. You get it to the next location, you set up the netting, plug everything in, and then you let them out. And uh, make Space it priming? Um, right now I have seven of them in there. I'm thinking probably, I don't know, maybe 10 to 12. In that small What's that? In that small box. In that? In that in, size? It, it, yes, sir. Yeah. In, 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 in terms of any kind of like hard, heavy rain in the wintertime or in snow, things of that nature, um, this also can be used where you use a, the deep bedding method where you just layer the, uh, the hay on it. And so uh, if, if right now we have three of them that are pregnant. That was another thing I didn't find out until um, <laughs> after, I, after I got the, the animals. So um, so then I um, also on the end here, we have a can tow the mobile composter. So follow the uh, order of operations, cover crops, um, then you go into uh, animals. And why are animals important? Because where are you gonna get uh, manure? Where are you gonna get your, your compost? This stuff is not cheap, it's very expensive, right? biggest problems and the idea is that if you're using a field for farming you are worried about certification um, organic certification the animals have to be off that land for uh, I, I forget what the time frame but it's a little while right yeah. um, so what I come up with is a solution and it is a mold composter and so the idea is uh, these barrels are very inexpensive you can pretty much get them wherever you're at and you can get, this isn't a good example of it, but they come, the handles, easy, pull it off, put it back on. Um, and the way it works is it follows behind the, the barn. And, um, and so, you know, the tires, any used tire shop will give you free tires, um, are cut size. And so those basically give the clearance to where you can push this thing real easy. Um, it's very inexpensive, easy to roll, and that cover crop roller, or the, the um, you know, Cooper? Yeah, Cooper. It, it can go right on top of it. And the idea is that the clearance, so that's three inches, so then you've got six inches, so, so it rolls fine, but then when you get to your raised mounds, it makes contact, because the mounds are higher than, y'all understand? I'm not speaking English right now, so hopefully you understand. Um, okay, so, and the idea is that you can actually, I'm working on a way for this to hook up on the back of the mobile barn, so it actually comes falling behind it, but even if you are pushing it regularly, you're getting that aeration, which it needs not to go anaerobic, um, and you're basically cleaning up. So I spend five, ten minutes a day in, this, in clean up, because the idea is my fields, we have a bunch of people come out, like, you know, there are some pathogens that will get into the soil with the coccilia, I think, and, and uh, oftentimes, like Southerners, there was a stereotype back in the day that Southerners are slow and, and lazy and a little unintelligent. And the reason why is because many of the Southerners used to have hookworm. And they would get it as kids, it would, it would mess up their uh, development. And also they'd be anemic, so they wouldn't want to do anything. And so, um, you know, the idea of us being able to, it solves a bunch of problems for one, or at once. It might not be something everybody wants to do, but if you did want to do it, uh, you would get the benefits of you're moving your animals anyways. So now you have your um, you're, you're pulling the um, the poops off off the ground so that kids aren't stepping in them. And you know if you're worried about the certification, that's not an issue. And you're uh, moving it. So inside here you can put a drainage sock, a perforated or corrugated tube um, that will allow it to have additional oxygen. It's not even necessary, I don't imagine. But uh, that, that is an option, and, and the idea is that as this is moving, um, 
inside here, you can either put in your wood chips or if you use the deep met, uh, bedding method, you just take that straw out and put it in here with, with the, uh, and then the animals, they're still doing what they do on that land because they're still urinating and also they're, you're not going to get everything. So uh, you're, you are adding more fertility to the land. It's all conceptual stuff. You guys might say, I'm carrying one and apologize. Um, no, yes, sir. It's, so cool. I, it's a cool concept. Uh, and have you made this thing yet? Um, so right now, I have a version of it. I have one. Somebody gave us a um, old school giant green composter. Are you guys familiar with this thing? Mm -hmm. It's it's massive. It's 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 not a good idea. This the the, the tire option is going to be much better. Try and push this thing, especially as it's getting full. You can um, put a handle on that. What's that? Not a handle on that. You have to you have to have brackets that come over the top of it. Yeah, there's so many things we can. In, um, I'm not claiming like this is, again, this is what I'm trying to do. What am I trying to do? I don't know what I'm trying to do. I'm going to stop talking. Go ahead. I was asking is, is half of what I wanted to ask is yeah. how are you going to make sure that there are, uh, you know, um, holes within it so that oxygen is flowing in and out of that tank when, and then you roll it so and the material is not coming out of it. Yeah, so when you're when you're getting that that can be resolved fairly easily. There's a bunch of different options. One is that tube, um, so the corrugated drain tube, right? Um, one is there's going to be space for oxygen to be in there, right? You don't have to have fresh air coming into it. You have to have oxygen. In. So when when it's something anaerobic, it means there's compaction. There's no oxygen in there. So having that corrugated tube there would provide that. A corrugated tube could also on the bottom. Imagine this is the bottom. Um, you know, be mounted to where you're basically pinning it into the sides, um, and then you have a hole in here, so it's a permanent thing, so that way every time it goes around, it actually, because what could happen is it all stays right here, right? When you're pulling it, it's like clumped up right here, and so it's not actually rolling over. So if you have that tube pinned in on the side, it's going to cause it to flip over. I understand. That makes sense. I understand that. Yeah, it's constantly turning. And this is every day. As the microbes breathe, you don't think there's going to be like, uh, CO2 build up within the tank or so the side right here if you had a large hole with um, and these are all great questions and these are the things again it's hard to like yeah, go I'm, through I'm 12 and brainstorm yeah yeah that's cool uh, so imagine a large hole <laughs> right and this is the same thing those mantis units the big green composters have on the sides they have holes and they have a filter on it they have metal grate on it yeah that's all you need a little metal grate on there and I don't think that it's really because you have to think, when you get to where you're going, each day you're putting it upright, you're opening it up. It's not like it's just turning into this uh, um, closed system that can't breathe. I understand that if you leave it as is, these are designed to fill barrels so they won't breathe. But to put in holes, I mean, drilling a bunch of holes is not going to lose a bunch of material. Even if you brought out a small little drill and just drilled it, it'd be fine. Yeah, right. Make sense? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So that's the material is getting out, but how is it getting in? Yeah, I'm just scooping it up and I'm putting it in there. Yeah, and and there is an idea. So in the winter time, it's hard to make compost uh, because of the heat, right? Well, the idea is that I had this another thing. I, I was gonna wait. I'll just how much time? I'm gonna skip it. I can go into well. I'll just quickly. Okay, so um, <laughs> if we had a bunch of these in a in a circle, right? And I have a uh, windmill aerator. And um, I have plans for a tube in here that's hooked up to the nozzle, so you just plug the aerator so when in the wintertime is when the, the windmill's moving, it's pumping oxygen into it, and then we do a Jean Hain method where you use a bunch of wood chips and you make a big active compost around it, so it would potentially create a, um, I haven't even explored that one, I, I didn't plan on exploring, but yeah, there's some other things going on. I have 16 things, I limited down to 12, I don't even know if I'm going to get through these 12, so I'm going to move on. Um, all right, so solar herb distiller. Um, distillation of essential oils is uh, not something in which uh, is very easy to do on a small scale. The reason why is because it takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, to boil your water. And so typically, um, people that are making essential oil are doing it on a large production scale. Um, the idea is that most farmers have herbs here and there. <laughs> At times throughout the season that they could harvest a little bit and get a little bit of oil but if you're making essential oil that's not how it works you harvest when your lavender comes in and you do a big oil production right because uh, it's not worth it otherwise well in this situation it changes that so this is called a, a uh, parabolic cooker and 
way a parabolic mirror works is the sun shines, concentrates on a singular point, it gets about 800, 900 degrees. Um, the distiller is placed on top of it. Again, this is an appropriation. So I didn't make this, I didn't make this. Um, I have looked in research how to make parabolic cheap, um, mirrors fairly cheap. I also have a background in working with metals, so I think the distiller, this is actually the system I currently have right here. And it, it works. Again, I wouldn't be presenting this if I didn't have confidence that this technology works. So um, the idea is that you've got basically two gallons of plant material, uh, three gallon, or I'm sorry, two gallons of water, three gallons of plant material. Um, the water boils, the steam goes through the plant material, um, comes through the uh, condenser. This is hooked up to a solar water pump, uh, cycling water through it, and out comes essential oil. And so it's um, it's designed for small batch production, but it's an additional revenue generator. Once it's paid for, it's pretty much um, you know you, you don't have any other expenses. And if you use proper now, I'll, I'll go ahead and you know again my, my goal is to I'm not trying to sit here and like impress you guys. I want to share with you guys my ideas. <coughs> If there's things that I know are concerns, I want to make sure that you guys are aware of some of those concerns. Um, this gets hot. Like you put a piece of paper in, it's like instant fire. And these these distillers, this wouldn't work. This is this is the I'm trying to make a PowerPoint so I download it and stuff and put a copper and burn a hole through this stuff. Like even the thin thin uh, metal, ours has got a hole getting ready to get burned through it. So You'd have to, and there's there's options, you know, there's um, essentially putting a plate on top of it, um, getting thicker metal on that. The other thing is, obviously, the bigger your distiller or your parabolic mirror is, the better. Um, this is a sole source, is what we use, it's one of the best on the market. Um, it's barely cutting it. If we can get one, which I'm under the impression that this is something that's doable. Um, again, this is more just to kind of give you guys a... Um, Expose you guys to ideas. Um, so essential oil, small batch production, lifetime supply with no energy costs, maintenance free, highly durable, creates valuable essential oil and hydrosol. Hydrosol is floral water, it can also be marketed. Uh, I think of rose water. Um, distiller can also be used for making water, making fuel, making other things if you want those things. Uh, they're illegal, so we're not talking about them. Uh, parabolic <laughs> cookers can be used for cooking also. Uh, this technology is useful in other applications. Problem is, so it's originally designed for, um, both these things aren't really good products, I'll be honest. Because the idea is that a small distiller doesn't produce, unless if you're using it for essential oil, it doesn't produce enough essential oil to pay for the amount of propane you need to heat this thing, all right? This parabolic cooker is cool conceptually. It gets 900 degrees. If you put a pan on there and you got a hot spot of 900 degrees and the rest of the pan is cold, what happens? burn the crap out of whatever's on that mark, right? Um, well, if you're boiling water, it doesn't matter. And there are also different pans that are available that you can use to cook. So there, there, there is use for these things um, outside of just this one application, but this is something that, that I came up with. So in addition to this, I'm trying to stare at the time, I'm really trying to push through it. Um, another big thing is shelf stability, right? So you Figure out how to grow a crop, you get the crop, you're either going to make a, a value added product, put some essential oil, or you want to actually dry it. What is available right now when you type in solar dryer? Um, you find the land of tinkerers, right? All these guys with carpenter degrees, and they build these boxes. And these boxes, I'm sure you guys have seen them, um, they get way hot. They get super hot. If you ever see one of these small little contraptions, for one, there's not a lot of space in there. Um, they either cook the food or if it's not sunny, they get moldy. It's like you have one extreme or the other. And so, but in my mind, I'm always asking the question, like, what are you accomplishing? You're creating an environment. What do you need to dry things out, to dehydrate things? You need an environment that's warm or, you know, you need heat and you need airflow. That's what you need, right? Um, so that's what I've come up with. So this is this is the current design. And the idea is, I mean, use a shipping container. I love shipping containers, they're fantastic. You can get them, I mean, for us, it's a metaphor, you know, to use, this This. This. This is awesome. This thing is made out of quartz and steel. This is the strongest steel available. In countries like America, we import a lot, we don't export as much. So they sail across our oceans. Guess what happens when they get to our shores? Their mission is over. It's more expensive to chop it up and send it to China to get melted than it is just to discard it, which is why you have hundreds of thousands of these that are discarded. 
They fit on the back of a uh, the tow truck and come and pick it up, or a flatbed with a uh, forget what the system's called, a little lift bed, and so they can easily be moved. Um, they're designed in such a way in which you can stack them on top of each other, uh, many fold, in a very similar to a veteran. A veteran is very capable. Veterans are very capable, but they're trained for a particular mission. And oftentimes when they come back, that mission isn't relevant. And there's this idea of, like, for us, this is why we use the shipping container for our bunkhouse, you know, as a metaphor to try to repurpose a given a new mission, this strong vessel with so much potential. And in terms of using it in this capacity, I mean, shipping containers get hot if you've ever been in one that's not insulated. And if you paint it black, it gets even hotter. And you put a solar attic fin on the top, lift it on the base, and cut holes on the base, what do you create? You create a convection. Now you have the ability for air to flow and for things to dry. I'm sorry? Um, it, that's, that's debatable. It, it depends on if it's used, if it's a high, um, what are they called? The high cubes versus the standards. Um, they range in various prices, but um, here are some of the benefits. Uh, Corten steel is incredibly durable. Uh, very little carpentry skill is required. They're easy to transport and readily available. Uh, there's space for large amounts of plant material. Uh, electric dehumidifier can be added into it if needed. Uh, rolling door options and ramps can be added. They come in different um, you know, configurations. Uh, secures your investment if you, you can also use it. This is another thing. This, the stuff that you're making is worth money, and uh, you can also use it for storage. And then solar panels can be um, added, installed for lights, blowers, and, and additional security. I didn't add inexpensive because inexpensive is relative. I think this is a, a suitable option when you compare it to the cost and the time that you're putting into this. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's worth looking into. All right, so I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to try to push through these last. So keyhole culture, keyhole garden. Uh, this is a traditional keyhole garden. Um, these are used in Africa a lot. They're fantastic. They're really great with moisture retention. Um, but the idea is that you were creating um, in the center here, this is a, a, a bin made out of mesh. And um, you put in your compost, and as the compost uh, decomposes or the plant material decomposes, whatever is the vegetable scraps, it leaches into the bed. And so the bed is, uh, fertility is kind of inside. The problem with the traditional uh, keyhole is there's no way to get into that compost in the center. So the compost is down at the top. Um, Hue culture is a technique where you bury logs and um, the logs as they rot. Um, well, let me just go into the next. Actually, I'm going to show you guys a video of the one that. So this is ours, and uh, this is a medicinal herb garden. Uh, we have a, a natural path that went through uh, the side road, and she, she teaches people how to use them. Uh, each of the beds are different systems of the body. So this um, compost unit in the center, it, it is basically those cheap black things. I don't know if you guys have seen these things. Uh, you can get them very uh, inexpensively. They're readily available. This, this uh, block was given to us. Um, and that, let me just go back there. Um, this area here, uh, the idea is that underneath here, we dug out um, the ground. So that went down four foot deep. And inside there, we put a bunch of logs. And then we, we stacked up the bricks or blocks and then we put that soil back on top of here. Before we did that, we took a corrugated drainage tube, which is right here. It goes down all the way through here, runs through the system, it comes into here. So this actually has got airflow going through it. Um, the top comes off, the compost is available here, so you can pull it out, put it back here. Um, some of the benefits to it are um, the, the compost, which you can actually have worms in here. Um, that's leaching, because it has slots, slits cut into it. Um, if you guys notice on the front here, uh, this thing right here, right, you can construct it. A, uh, a dome over it, and that can, you can put shake cloth for the summer. Um, the corrugated pipe keeps things from going anaerobic. Uh, the stone on the sides acts as a heat sink. Uh, the biological activity that's happening in the ground here for the first couple years, the side heat um, capture, if, when the dome gets put on here, if that's covered in plastic, this unit here can be emptied and charged, meaning you put straw and manure in here, and if you ever flip a compost bottle, it's hot, the biological activity. Well, that heat 
is going to allow this here to be a hotbed so you can grow potentially pineapple to the winter without any additional heat source. Um, the raised bed gives it excellent drainage, um, but then you also got great uh, water retention because of the uh, It's handicap accessible and um, yeah, the, the, the wood acts as a sponge so it absorbs the water and is available if it needs it, but then if, if it's raining too much it, it's easily uh, drainable so the plants don't have wet feet. Um, do I have time for our last, are we on our last one? Um, we have two prototypes, I'm going to go real quick. Um, aquaponics is something a lot of people don't like to talk about. I don't personally like aquaponics, I really don't. It's one of those topics to where when people geek out on me about all their aquaponics, and just, I'd rather be in soil. The reality is there's a lot of nutrient catchment ponds on people's properties, farmers, right? And those nutrients, whether it's the fish or the, the nutrients from the garden, are in that pond, they're eventually in our area going to the Mississippi Delta. And so my thoughts are, how can we do aquaponics in a way that actually makes sense? Because the reality is when you're using it for greens, you can grow greens about three times the rate than soil grown. Now there's questions in terms of the nutrients, I get that, but um, there are nutrients in that water that, in my opinion, let's figure out how to use them. And so if you took a float tray and you put it on a pond, and let's say our pond, our pond has a um, windmill aerator, so you have plenty of oxygen, you have plenty of nutrients. Why is it that if you put a plug tray on it, it wouldn't grow? It would look like this instead of this. What are the difference between the two? This right here had that exact water <laughs> from that pond pumped out of it, went through a mechanical filter into a holding tank, and then it was planted. And the idea is that if you put that directly into the pond, in a month, this is what you would end up with. And what are these? These are black roots. So the root fibers of the plant, the solids have accumulated on it. And so the way that you do a pump is you pump the water out, electricity, uh, then you need the pump. Going through a filter, consistent maintenance, into a holding tank also consistently has to be drained. Um, and then you can grow your, what have you done? The one thing that you're doing is you're keeping the solids from accessing the plant roots, right? Mechanical filter. Just think um, shade cloth, or not shade cloth, a uh, silt fence. What does a silt fence do when you put a silt fence on your property? It keeps particles from going through and it allows water to pass. And so this is a this is still a prototype, but the idea is we're gonna be making a, uh, a float tray. If you can imagine you know, the netting to protect your flea beetles, uh, that concept, not that material, but that concept, flip it upside down and you build a cage around the base of it using 30-year um, geotextile. So it's got no UV sun degradation, so it should last for a very long time. And theoretically, in my mind, it seems like it should work in terms of providing uh, the plants to have access to the nutrients without any of the solids being able to accumulate. And because, you know, when you're sucking that water through a pump, you're going to clog it up. There's very little PSI when it's just flowing through, so it shouldn't clog up the um, geotextile. You should just be able to rinse it off. So I'm going to the last one, and that is um, humanure. It's a really important conversation. It's something that people have a phobia. Nobody likes to talk about poop. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one. And aerobic composting is typically what people think of when they talk about um, doing, doing um, you know, uh, composting toilets. Um, EM, uh, it's also used, uh, it's a term called Bugachi, which is um, it's inoculated um, uh, grain, uh, grain, I think. And, um, and so the idea is that um, if you create a system, and this is the idea. So right now, like, again, to be sustainable, it's environmental sustainability, it's social sustainability. Society has to be able to, to deal with this, right? The idea of taking five gallon buckets of poop and putting them in and turning it, like there are people in this room that are down with that, but I assure you there's a whole lot of people that aren't. And so what I'm trying to say is what about those people? Because that's the vast majority of the people on the planet. And if we can come up with solutions that actually mean something, they have to address the vast majority of the people on the planet. Um, so this system here, that trash can can slide up underneath it. You want it to be anaerobic. So, you know, uh, aerobic composting versus anaerobic fermentation, uh, things that are fermenting don't smell. When you smell pathogens, really funky smells from anaerobic soils, it's because, you know, that methane, all that stuff, that's an indication that there's a lot of pathogens in there, right? 
Um, when you go to make pickles, they don't really hassle you because when the pH is so low, those pathogens don't exist. And so when you use a um, you know EM in an anaerobic setting, it's a slightly sour smell, but it's not like a putrid smell. Um, it eliminates the need for turning it, for touching it. You fill the bin up, you push it off to the side, you let it sit for a year, however long you want to let it sit for. And then um, the way, uh, so the bugashi can be made out of uh, sawdust. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive and easy to set up. Um, you know, these gallon dr drums come up to 95. I would suggest probably not even going halfway because you don't want this thing to, that's the last thing you want to have halfway. <laughs> 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 really bad idea. Um, and so the bins can be swapped out. So if you're trying to scale it with an operation like ours, you pull it out, put one in, uh, and then the finished product can be buried. Um, and, and it's a slightly sour smell. And I got through the end. Um, I've got one more video I can show you guys, or we can answer questions. It's uh, five minutes. No, we have ten minutes. Do y'all want to watch one video on the farm, or do you want to engage in questions? Okay. All right. So this will be the last uh, <coughs> thing, and then we'll, if we have time, go through some questions. Can y'all hear it? No. Hey, I'm gone. What happened? Did I lose it? When I was just touching it, it went away? Is there... Um, oh, there was never a video on. Um, is there somebody that can help me? Oh, there we are. Okay, I figured it out. Well, that doesn't look good. Now you got the screen on the base. Um, that's fine. And, yeah, let's start it over again. Cool. Hey, I'm John Ashton, and welcome to the Veterans Healing Farm. We're standing in the hops. It's 24 foot post. We've got 20 foot hops growing on it. This, just like everything else that we have going on here, is very community focused. We exist to aid veterans as they reintegrate into civilian life and to combat the alarming suicide rates, which have grown through an epidemic of over 22 veterans a day. The biggest thing I like about the Veterans Healing Farm is the sense of community that you get. You get to come, you get to hang out, you get to eat good food, you can talk about the week behind you, you can talk about the week in front of you, um, and just really get to connect with people a little more of an intimate level than, than what you normally do. Having the community here with other veterans and other people from the local community has been really helpful just making it feel like a home. For a military guy that's coming from uh, the military, which is so tight-knit, transitioning into the current American culture, it's very isolating and it's very easy to just not really know how to plug in, where to go to find friendships and, and to really cultivate community. So we want to make that process as easy as possible for these guys and we want to give them a lot of meaningful activities to be involved with and just really provide them that opportunity to have fun and to learn a sustainable skill. <laughs> This is the main garden at the Veggie Healing Farm. We've got 27 50 foot rows, and we've got a variety of different produce that we grow out here. We've got beautiful flowers. We've got not only great tasting vegetables, but we've also got an aesthetic beauty that's attached to the garden as well. You need to be a part of every step of the process from mounting the rows to planting the seeds and then watching them grow and being able to harvest and go home every week with just a basket full of produce. For guys that have been exposed to a lot of death, there's something about putting the seed in the ground and nurturing the seed and watching it become something that's not only going to nurture their body, but it's going to benefit and give life to others as well. It often provides a strong sense of personal empowerment through the realization that their efforts and contributions are truly valued and are important to the community that they belong to. The healing that people can get is really incredibly valuable. We can get away from the stress of things. Like I'm in school right now and I work full time, got two kids and home projects and just all these other things going on. So 
when I come out here to the Veterans Healing Fund, I know that I can get away and get a break from those things and really just kind of enjoy the community, my family, without all those extra things just piling up on it. It's an opportunity to come and sit and work in this space. It's so great to really um, process through some experiences, think about where you're going, what you want to do, and then also have that opportunity in community to uh, just live life together and, and really get to know other people and be known by other people. The transition was difficult for me, getting out of the Air Force, serving just for so long. It really had become a family in a lot of ways, and so when I wasn't there anymore, it was less about the job, it was more about having a community. So being part of the Veterans Healing Farm has really been one of those things to fill in that gap left over from not being in the culture. So this bridge is a representation of the transition that we really try to cultivate at the Veterans Healing Farm. You know, our goal is to really help people transition from the military into the civilian world. It's great to have a community sometimes to, to bounce ideas, to, to pick weeds while you're processing through. Our goal is to transition, it's, it's to walk from one point to the next and to, to be that bridge. Thanks for being with us. Uh, if you want to learn more or support us, feel free to visit our website. It's www.veteranshealingfarm.org. It's about that time. Um, our purpose, so that video was four years ago, a lot's changed since then. But um, that facility I was telling you guys about, what we've done is essentially created a, a template. We've demonstrated proof of concept. We've created something in which was very difficult to do. Um, getting a 501c3 you know, status. Uh, writing a business plan, uh, writing bylaws, running the board meeting, all of these various components, farming the techniques. So what I'm passionately, like, fervently, what's so fervently, as quickly as possible, pouring myself into trying to take this information, make it available to any veteran throughout the country that would want to do something remotely similar to what we've done, um, let them know what's worked for us, and it's not just veteran. I mean, this information is open source. It's, it's available to the public. And it's our way of saying, this is what's worked for us. Eat the meat, spit out the bones, take whatever you like about it, discard whatever you don't. And just really encourage people to share ideas. So um, the tools, the idea with that is I may, I'm making a deposit into a bank account. And I'm encouraging anybody to make a withdrawal. And I believe people have great ideas. And I think oftentimes it's easy to live in a framework of scarcity where we, we feel like we have to take care of ourselves and, and this is something that we've come up with and we have to patent it. Whereas to live in abundance and to share and to, to recognize that like the way our society is structured right now, we have to cooperate, we have to work together. And so it's easy to encourage people, oh, if you come up with a good idea, give it away free and take the things that you work really hard on and give them away free. But when you're actually in that position, it's much different. It's much more difficult to actually you know, do it rather than just talk about it. And so what I'm hopeful for is that this, um, what we're doing is, is going to inspire others to participate in, in the process. Yes, ma'am. Um, you didn't talk much about this part of it, but how are you funded? Are, are veterans, like, do they pay for training or are they sponsored? That's the question everybody always asks, which is a very relevant question. Um, three ways of our finances and then it's almost about that time. Um, my three financial, this is, this is more of a joke, um, I implement the uh, Burden Sanders technique, which is uh, $20 donations, the MacGyver technique, uh, which is uh, bubble gum in, in uh, rubber bands, and uh, strike anywhere match, and the Field of Dreams approach. And so I, I jokingly say that, um, honestly, it's hard to even describe. I mean, this has been a, a tremendous sacrifice for my family. Um, you know, my first date with my wife, again, 2007, I was sharing this with her. And I've, I've, I've desired to do this for a long time, so I've done different things that have set me up to be able to do this. Um, prior to this, I was uh, at a successful web development, social media marketing um, business, in which was able to put me in a position in 2014 to 
to work full time. In 2015, I went salary. So my wife hired the <coughs> salary. I made 18,000 in 2015. Last year, I made uh, 24,000. My wife made 9,000. And that's all the income we lived on. And so we have two kids. It's 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 not easy to do this. The beauty is I don't share that to. You know, this is the way it works, right? If it's easy, more people would be doing this stuff. But in my mind, like, it's worth it. And so, um, you know, I feel like we're almost there. <laughs> I've been holding on for dear life for a minute now. But uh, we're, we're making moves, and, uh, and things are progressing. And as you would notice in our new logo, which you can't see here, if you go on the website, we actually have a female. So that was something people pointed out. Said, Where are the ladies at? What was this... Uh, Two dudes nonsense, so um, we have a different logo. And uh, thank you guys for your time. Thank you for coming out, and I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'll be here um, tomorrow. And obviously available tonight. So. Does anyone have questions?